philosophy is not a luxury. Born of leisure, it has become a necessity for a thriving democracy. Indeed, philosophical thinking is essential to help each of us sort out the complex choices that we confront in our daily lives. The series title, Breaking Bad, calls up stark choices, often forced by constraints beyond our control, such as the threats from many quarters of society and on campus to the humanities and the events of March 21st. It is against the recent landscape of faculty retrenchment and student protests on campus that I find events such as this one today to be precarious and precious. The idea of an affordable, high-quality public university should not be plagued by stark choices. We philosophers, philosophy students, common media students, fellow academics, lovers of ideas, are tasked with responding to the challenges of our time, aptly framed in part by the subtitle of this event, Work, Austerity, and Autonomy. <clears throat> it is important that each of you are here and that we have this time to engage today. Let me say a word about our two speakers. Professor Reed is a tenured member of the philosophy department. He received his PhD in philosophy from SUNY Binghamton in 2001 with a dissertation on Marx. We hired him first in 2001, and after various financial constraints at USM, we were finally able to tenure him in 2005. In addition to many scholarly publications, he has published a book, The Micropolitics of Capital, Marx and the Prehistory of the Present in 2003. And he has a second book, which is probably finished, with the working title, Relations of Production, Trans-Individuality Between Economics and Politics. He's presented his work in many places here and abroad, including Italy, London, the Netherlands, Tokyo, and on our continent, Montreal, Georgia, North Carolina, Utah, Minnesota, Ohio, Seattle, and on it goes. At USM next fall, he'll be teaching political philosophy and 19th century philosophy. In the spring, he will be teaching the politics of work and a course entitled War, Technology, and Fascism. I encourage you to sign up for his courses. We're lucky to have him here at USM, and he will begin with presenting his theory about why we love Breaking Bad, and that will be followed by Professor, um, uh, that, that will be followed by my colleague in the Communication and Media Studies Department, uh, Professor David Pearson. Um, he also joined the faculty in 2001. Um, he received his PhD in mass communication from Penn State University after working in um, audiovisual production companies in North Texas and Louisiana. He's published a book on Breaking Bad that came out in November entitled Breaking Bad, Critical Essays on the Context, Politics, Style, and Perception of the Television Series. His Breaking Bad book is not his first crack at research on popular TV shows. He's also published work on CSI, The Fugitive, Mad Men, Seinfeld, and Combat. He has been interviewed about his work on a variety of television stations and has presented his papers in Switzerland and around the country. Um, following uh, Professor Pearson's comments on Professor Reed's talk, we'll open up the discussion to your questions and comments, and we will also have uh, some refreshments uh, in the back. So, Professor Reed. Thank you. Um, and thanks to everyone for coming out. Um, and quick note, not, maybe not now, but before you leave, if you're in Philosophy 241, make sure you sign this. I want to say a couple things briefly about you know, why, why I'm talking about this. Um, one is directly related to my politics and philosophy work class, but one of the things we do in that class is along with talking about what philosophers have to say about work from Plato and Aristotle to Hegel and Marx, we also look at representations of work in popular culture, primarily in, in film, but it occurred to me that um, since, as people so often say, television is the new film, I wanted to include a television series, but it's hard to sort of do them in a class context because you can't really say, I mean, streaming services aside, please go watch five seasons of a television show before the next class, which doesn't make sense to do that. So. Um, uh, and I should say at the get-go, if you haven't seen the show, I'll try to say a little bit about what it's about. Uh, if you have seen the show and haven't seen how it all ends, I'm, I apologize in advance. There will be spoilers. Um, so the title of my talk 
is in some sense borrowed from or adopted from a book came out a few years ago by, by Adam Kotzko called Why We Love Sociopaths. It's quite, it's quite a good little book. Uh, I recommend picking it up. And in that book, he looks at the broader context of the common denominator of a lot of very popular shows, the kind of shows that are on HBO or AMC or other cable networks and that get a great deal of, of, of fan uh, devotion as well as attention in, in publications. They have in a sort of common denominator, most of their characters are sociopaths, people who are able to violate the rules of society by you know, murdering, lying, cheating, etc., um, but able to often present a front as being, you know, a regular New Jersey suburbanite, as in Tony Soprano, an advertising executive, as in, uh, in Don Draper, or and so on. Um, and he suggests that his answer to the why we love is in part that we love sociopaths because we all want to break these various rules, and we wish we could, and we can't, so so on. Um, but as the subtitle of my talk suggests, I want to argue that some of the particular pleasures and particular enjoyment and engagement with Breaking Bad have a lot to do with the way in which uh, questions of economic austerity, questions of work, and questions of trying to have some semblance of autonomy in our society are really the subtext of the entire show. Um, I don't think it's an accident that the show premiered in 2008 and pretty much its entire run is the run of the, the latest uh, recession in the U.S. Um, and so to talk about that, I want to foreground it so you get a sense of what I'm talking about. As you probably, probably know, the basic plot of Breaking Bad has to do with a chemistry professor or teacher, I'm sorry, at a high school named Walter White, who is diagnosed in the first episode with pretty much inoperable lung cancer. And because of that and because of other circumstances in his life, he decides to quote unquote break bad to uh, become a cook fabricating crystal meth and use with the idea that he could generate enough money to compensate for the fact that he's going to be gone and he will not be able to care for his children. He has a son with cerebral palsy and he has a new, at the beginning of the show, a new daughter uh, on the way. Um, and so one of the immediate responses, and there are multiple versions of this, which I think is interesting, to the show's economic subtext comes in the form of this cartoon. Um, and there's, there are multiple versions of this. There's Breaking Bad in France, where it's, the joke is always the same. The country changes, but the joke is always the same. The joke is, to some extent, if this story was happening someplace else, anywhere else but the US, someplace that had you know, state uh, provided health care, and you know, leave aside the issue of what's happening to those states that do offer that, but um, that the show would be one very dull episode, right? <laughs> that uh, Walter White would find out that uh, his cancer is going to be taken care of, and thus at the last panel you see the, uh, the iconic Heisenberg cat and sunglasses for sale. And so this is probably what I mean by austerity, that the, the underlying context of the show is one in which budget, state budgets are being cut, the kind of budgets that might provide health care for uh, school workers, and that uh, in general, jobs are being cut, economic opportunities are reduced, and the entire backdrop of the show takes place in an at atmosphere of, sorry, I'm trying to get my next image, of scarcity. Um, and this permeates the entire show. I think one of the things that's interesting about the show is that these sort of issues that I'm talking about don't just show up in the plot, but they also show up in the props and locales. Uh, it gives the backdrop of austerity. I think it's I always think it's very amusing and very smart that the creators of the show decided to make Walter White's car, at least his first car in the show, the Pontiac Aztec, often heralded as a absolute failure of the American automobile industry. <laughs> a car that in some sense, in its visuals, right, it suggests this sort of car of the future, right? It's sleek and it has all kinds of odd vents, but in its actual functioning, and here it is being battered uh, after Walter uh, White has used it to kill several uh, rival drug dealers. <laughs> it, uh, it never quite lives up to, to its promise. And 
This permeates the entire show. It, it's set often in strip malls and rundown housing developments. The entire, uh, even the colors, all these muted browns and grays, suggest that we are seeing an America in which the promise is gone. So that's what I mean by austerity. I want to say a few things about what I mean or how I understand the issue of work. Um, because I think that work, one of the things that interests me about work is that work means multiple things and does multiple things in our society. Uh, obviously, work is clearly indicated by the first element of the plot, that he's trying to cook crystal meth to make enough money, money that he can't make um, by being a chemistry teacher. Work doesn't just give us money, work also provides us, this is something that philosophers, especially Hegel, foregrounded quite strongly, work gives us a sense of recognition, of our sense of our place in the world. And one of the things that's interesting to me about Breaking Bad is that the show foregrounds the fact that Walter White is someone who both isn't making a lot of money, but he's also not getting the respect that he thinks he deserves we learn in the show that he, at one point, was involved in Nobel Prize winning research. There's a plaque in his house recognizing him for having participated in that. Uh, but when we see him at work, I have a clip of him at teaching high school um, from the very beginning of the show. One of the interesting things, if you go back to the show, if you watch it for a while, is you know, Brian Cranston, the main actor, plays Walter White. It came to the show from a situation comedy, Malcolm in the Middle and how much the early episodes rely on his backdrop in background in comedy, and especially sort of physical comedy and pratfalls and awkwardness. But um, I just want to show this quick clip of him teaching chemistry, which all the teachers in this room might relate to all too well. Um, and it's about chemistry is, well, technically, chemistry is the study of matter. But I prefer to see it as the study of change. Now, just just think about this. Electrons, they change their energy levels. Molecules, molecules change their bonds. Elements, they combine and change into compounds. But that's, that's all of life, right? I mean, it's just, it's the constant, it's the cycle. It's solution, dissolution, just over and over and over. It is growth then decay, then transformation. It is fascinating, really. <laughs> Chad, is there something wrong with your table? Okay, ionic bonds. <laughs> There's also, in the early episodes, we also learn that he's working as a car wash, moonlighting as a car, at a car wash to make ends meet. And that, those scenes, which I couldn't find on YouTube, unfortunately, um, they, those are scenes in which the, the level of, of disrespect that he gets from his students are even more intensified. He finds himself having to wash the cars of his own students who have more money than he does. So, um, so what I want to talk about when talking about Breaking Bad is that the... Um, the trajectory of the show is one in which Walter White is both breaking the rules, breaking bad, in order to get the money he needs, but he also finds that very much uh, getting him the respect that his, his job had failed to give him. Um, and so you have, and the funny thing about doing this, putting this presentation together and scouring YouTube to find the, 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 the things I wanted to find, is you find that the thing that's most popular on YouTube, and this goes back to why we love Breaking Bad, are the scenes that really foreground um, how. I mean, this is the scene to be read as almost the exact opposite of the failure of recognition in the classroom. Here we have Walter White. A few months later, he's been selling drugs. He shaved his head. Uh, he finds himself in that sort of den of middle class suburban masculinity, the large uh, building supply and hardware store. He's actually there working on a house home project, 
uh, and he runs into people who he immediately recognizes because of what they're buying, acetone and so on. He recognizes them immediately as rival uh, crystal meth dealers. And he puts aside his suburban concerns and comes out in the parking lot and we get this scene set to a great song by television on the radio. And there he is. That's, that's the guy. Stay out of my territory. So there's your master slave dialectic. Uh, or your chemistry teacher, meth dealer dialect, in some <laughs> sense. Because now, as a meth dealer, he's able to get the recognition that he couldn't otherwise arrive at. One of the interesting things about Breaking Bad, in terms of how it presents work, is that Walter White finds out that it's actually very difficult to be a, a meth dealer on your own. You have to deal with distribution. You have to deal with rivals who are not as easily intimidated as this guy in the parking lot is. And in the latter seasons, particularly the third and fourth season, Walter White finds himself working for Gus Fring. And Gus Fring is a, the sort of dominant uh, drug dealer of the American Southwest. But the interesting thing about Gus Fring is that his day job, rather than being a chemistry teacher, his day job that he keeps is that he owns and manages a series of fast food restaurants called uh, Los Pollos Hermanos. Uh, and he actually runs his empire out of that, which in my view always makes him a very chilling figure because um, he doesn't really spend his time, as you imagine, the stereotype of the drug dealer, sitting by a pool, luxuriating in his wealth. He spends his time in a, in a polyester blend shirt overseeing employees in a fast food restaurant, which makes him kind of frightening in my view because why the hell would you do that to get all that money? Uh, but the interesting thing about the context of the fast food restaurant is it really foreground some very interesting issues about work because if you know anything about fast food, if you've worked in fast food, fast food is a site of a rather aggressive de-skilling of the, the, the workers, right? All the skill and knowledge is in the machine. The fries and the fryer laters know how long to fry. You don't have to worry about how long to fry. And this is, has gained you know, the fast food industry great control, low wages, great control of the workers. Um, and Walter White's conflict with with uh, Gus Fring is very much foregrounded as a conflict not just over who's making money, but a conflict over who controls the knowledge. Because the whole idea is that Walter White has this formula. He's a better cook than all of your average crystal meth cook. He has this formula, and as long as he controls the formula, he has some degree of autonomy. And the struggle has to do, of course, with Gus trying to get someone to figure out to master the formula. And the show does a very interesting job of showing how this struggle over the formula of drugs is not too far from our economy in general. Um, there's this scene I'm going to show you next. This is one of the cold opens of Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad sort of excels, I think, at using those four or five minutes, or maybe even less, three minutes, that appear before the first commercial and before the opening credits even as kind of almost mini films. And in a particular episode, uh, they used this mini film to sort of foreground this connection between the fast food industry and the drug industry. <coughs> this is... In the little village where I was born, life moved at a slower pace, yet felt all the rich afloat. There, my two uncles were known far and wide for their delicious cooking. They seasoned their zesty chicken using only the freshest herbs and spices. People called them Los Pollos Hermanos, the Chicken Brothers. Today we carry on their tradition in a manner that would make my uncles proud. The finest ingredients are brought together with loving care, then slow cooked to perfection. Yes, the old ways are still best at Los Pollos Hermanos. But don't take my word for it. One taste, and you will know.
think it's interesting that the point of transition where the commercial ceases to be a commercial for the fast food enterprise and becomes a sort of montage of how industrialized the crystal meth enterprise is, is this line, the old ways are always the best, right? foregrounding the sense that at this moment in the, in the narrative of the show, Walter White has ceased to be a kind of artisanal, independent producer of crystal meth and has become part of this rather large enterprise with all kinds of people in lab coats and trucks and logistics and so on. Uh, but it's also interesting that, of course, the show's selection of crystal meth as the drug not only reflects the, the huge crystal meth uh, uh, problem that's going out throughout the, the U.S., especially in the, in the West, um, but it also foregrounds the fact that the interesting thing about crystal meth, unlike drugs like, say, for example, marijuana, where you could always hold on to this fantasy of growing your own and being your own independent artisanal producer, crystal meth is dependent upon highly industrialized processes, and thus you can never really grow your own. Um, you're always dependent upon chemistry and so on. And the interesting thing about this, uh, one of the other philosophers I think is very interesting about work is Kathy Weeks, and she points out not so much a contradiction, but as she argues, there are certain antinomies around how we think about work. And one of the antinomies, sort of irresolvable problems she foregrounds, is that it is through work that we often seek independence. Right? To have a job, to have your own job, is to be independent, no longer depend upon your parents or the state or whatever. But actually, when we go to work, we are actually placing ourselves independent of Dependence of our employers, of the entire set of market conditions we're dependent upon that are beyond our control. <laughs> and the show illustrates, I think, in a very interesting way, the struggle of this after, after Walt, Walter White has freed himself from Gus Fring and Los Polios Hermanos, he tries to go into business, well, not so much by himself, with his two other partners, Jesse um, and, and Mike, pictured in this here. And there's this scene where they have their money from their... Uh, they have their money from their first big haul, and they divide it into three nice, neat piles. And if you remember this scene, like, sorry, I couldn't <coughs> find it. Uh, what eventually happens is Mike, who's kind of in charge of actually running the day-to-day -day business, they're in charge of cooking, he's in charge of distribution. He subtracts from their piles. We have to pay this guy who's delivering for us. We have to pay this person who's uh, our muscle. And we have to pay this person. She's supplying us the, the, the methamphetamine. We need to make the make the drug, and so on. And the piles get smaller and smaller as uh, Walt begins to recognize that he is a lot less independent than he first believed. OK, so I want to sort of, um, now I've brought up a lot. There's a lot. It's a long show. We can get into a lot. But I want to sort of bring this to, to a point of conclusion, um, given that I've talked about this in terms of what a series of what I consider to be contradictions or different dynamics of work recognition and accumulation, dependence and independence. And to some extent, these contradictions inform a lot of the show, especially the accumulation and recognition thing. One of the things that Walt is constantly struggling with is he wants recognition. Um, he wants to be seen as the breadwinner. And there's a lot of a very masculine, very uh, certain idea about what it means to be a breadwinner. But you can't really do that when you're engaged in an illegal enterprise. So you can't really get the recognition summed up in this scene. Recognition all over again. Eyes on Bird. You're goddamn right. So, recognition, but you only get recognition from people like him or other drug dealers. Like, you never quite get the recognition he wants from his former workers in the Nobel Prize uh, research, his wife, and so on and so forth. And what, the sh what you're left with is just excessive accumulation. One of the interesting things to me about Breaking Bad is that it's also a show about the illegal drug trade is a show relatively free of the perks of any real consumption, of any bling whatsoever, with the exception of one automobile. Walt rarely ever buys anything that you would buy if you had all sorts of money, because the money is always a problem. And the show really foregrounds the fact that money is like a physical problem. Once you have so much money, you've hoarded so much money, what to do with it becomes the problem. You end up renting a storage unit to hold some of the money in. Um, so to conclude, I want to say a couple things about the last two episodes of the final season. Here, spoilers are going to be plenty. Uh, and I think it's very interesting that on the one hand, this, the, the second to last episode of the series, um, I think really foregrounds the way in which Breaking Bad is a show about our anxieties about it. Because what happens in the second to last episode, 
Well, Walt has managed to escape with his life. Um, and with he's lost most of his money. And he ends up in what I consider to be the worst retirement possible. He ends up in New Hampshire, I mean, no offense to New Hampshire, <laughs> in this tiny little cabin where he's not even able to get cable or internet service because, as his handler points out, cable brings people into your place and people might recognize you. So he almost ends up in this Midas-like situation. He's got an oil drum full of money, but all he can do is sort of sit with it in this tiny little cabin. He's taking care of his material existence, but he has no basis for any social existence. He's entirely isolated and cut off. And of course, Jesse has it even worse. Jesse ends up going from Walt, who was never really a great boss to begin with, treated with a great deal of contempt and abuse based on his intelligence, to working for Gus. And Gus tries to motivate him, tries to get him to see himself as someone important to his latest employer, Jake, and the, the white supremacists um, treat him as purely, they, they chain him to the walls and they make him cook meth. So we have two nightmare scenarios of our contemporary uh, sort of post-recession imaginary. One is the worst retirement you can imagine, mm -hmm. a retirement into poverty and, and deprivation on one hand, and then Jesse, who never gets free of work. Right? He's not able to ever stop working. He's literally chained to the wall. One of the very interesting things to me about the last episode which is often celebrated as being a very satisfying season finale, right? This is the sort of thing we talk about now in popular culture. How satisfying was that season finale? Uh, is that it begins, Jesse is introduced in the very beginning of the season finale. There's a scene, and this is one of these other scenes in Breaking Bad where you don't quite understand what the context is. A scene of him uh, very caringly and lovingly finishing this wooden box. Um, and earlier in the episodes, you know, Jesse is kind of a high school dropout, meth dealer, and so on, doesn't have high regard for himself. Uh, he talks at one point about this time that he made a wooden box in shop class. It's the only time he felt like he was doing something, that he knew what he was doing was meaningful. And we get this scene of him making a wooden box, and as the scene progresses, we learn that this is a fantasy. That at the end, he's, it cuts from him making this wooden box, and, and with great care, touching the grain of the wood, this very this scene of the craftsman as a kind of ideal, and then it quickly cuts to him chained to the roof of a warehouse, cooking meth again and again and again, because if he doesn't do it, they will kill the last meaningful person in his entire, in his entire life. Um, so I think one of the interesting things about this the last two episodes, the first episode gives us all of our nightmares, that we will have to work forever that we won't be able to retire, or that we'll retire only into poverty. The second episode gives us a great deal of cathartic satisfaction. Right? Walt gets to give money to his kids. He gets to machine gun or poison all of his enemies. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he gets, uh, also, he gets some sort of self-enlightenment. He finally admits who he really is and what he really is to his wife. Everyone understands, he understands who he is, and everyone understands uh, what he's doing. But I think the introduction of that scene of the wood suggests that we're in the realm of a kind of fantasy here, right? That the best that this popular culture, this show can do, is it can give us all of our anxieties, that our jobs will pay for our health care, that we will provide for our families, that we'll be stuck working forever. It gives us all those anxieties at a distance, right? Because a real show about a guy who just got lost his job, couldn't provide for health care, and didn't go Breaking Bad, would be a show that would last maybe one episode longer than the French version of Breaking Bad, where he just gets medical care, because it would be unwatchable, right? So it gives us all of our anxieties, but it gives us to us at a distance, and it supplements them with a sort of fantasy of um, solving all these problems through Breaking Bad. And of course, I think to look at the show critically is to ask the question, what would it be like, and this is, I think the political question, to confront all those anxieties without the fantasy that becoming a crystal meth dealer is a solution to our problems. So, thank you.